my wife and I were going through a hard patch in our in our marriage, and uh, she was uh, told to try Pioneer Drive Baptist Church by Bob Ed Shotwell, who used to be on the staff here. So she started going and um, taking the kids. She got me going, and then once I got here and I ran into so many people willing to uh, listen to me and reach out to me that I uh, just felt the need to uh, start volunteering and serving and give back to the church that gave back so much to us. How am I connected to Pioneer Drive? Presently um, teaching first grade Sunday school. I've been doing it for about five years. Alongside with my wife, she teaches with me. I've done parking lot, valet, uh, help with the stage at uh, Easter pageant. Love doing that. I try to stay as connected as much as possible. Pioneer Drive gives me so much. Sometimes it's overwhelming. But I can't seem to uh, put to words. I just feel it. Um, I love the people. They've done so much for me. I just love to give back. I love everything about this church. To watch my kids grow up in this church and the kind of kids they become. And I can see the fruits of my labor and what God's told me to do to try to be the best parent that I could be. So when I try to give back to Pioneer Drive, I think of that. I want other families to experience what I have. If they're lost and they come here, they need to be found. This church will find you. This church does so much for people. Take someone like me and I look at what my life is like now. It's night and day. I've gone from the darkness to the light. I love my Lord. I love my family and I love everyone here so much. That's Dean Draper. Dean and Donna have been an uh, integral part of the ministry of Pioneer Drive for many years now, and it's great to hear how he got connected. We'll be hearing from uh, other of your fellow church members. Uh, the first two happen to be fellows. The next four, I think, are, are ladies. So, uh, ladies, don't feel slighted. Your day's coming, and uh, uh, don't want us to get in trouble, Pioneer Drive. Uh, but, uh, but, but, but I can't wait to till we hear from all these folks, and it's, uh, it's all part of our uh, series on unity. Uh, he used the word connection a lot in his testimony, Dean did, and that, uh, that's part of the definition of, of unity. We, we built this definition starting last week when we preached on one church, one Lord. Let's read this definition again. A gift of the Holy Spirit that enables a church to experience common connection and purpose. Now, unity is a gift of the Holy Spirit. As we said last week, some of the gifts of the Spirit are given to you individually. Other gifts, the Holy Spirit gives to the church corporately. And unity is one of those gifts. Again, last week we talked about one church, one Lord. And our text was the Shema of the ancient Israelites, Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, and with all your might. We saw from that that the source of our unity is not a a church building. It's not a church program. It's certainly not a church personality. It is the Lord, one God. And we are to, to worship that God and love Him and give Him all of our loyalty and all of our devotion. And we also saw the importance of incorporating God's love into uh, the different aspects of our life. Last week we had a handout, and I thought I had it here with me. It's somewhere. Ah, here it is. We had the, 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 the diagram of the different dimensions where we are to incorporate and express the love of God. There's the upward dimension in our love for God, the, the outward dimension, the inward dimension, and we even incorporated or invented a new word, the withward uh, dimension of God's love, where we share God's love with the people that we are with on a daily basis.
Today we're going to change focus just a little bit. Unity, one church, one mission. And our text is the 17th chapter of John's Gospel. I want to encourage you to open your Bibles to that text and, and keep them open because we're going to be referring to it throughout the, uh, uh, the study this morning. John chapter 17 is to the New Testament a little bit what uh, Exodus 2 and 3 is, the burning bush experience for Moses in the Old Testament. When we read this passage, folks, we are really on holy ground. In this passage, we're privileged to hear Jesus praying as he closes his time with his disciples in the upper room. They're getting ready to go out to the Garden of Gethsemane, and then from there, he will go and be judged, and then in a matter of hours, he will be crucified. He's just shared the Lord's Supper with his disciples. He has just told them that he is going to leave. He's going back to the Father, and they are brokenhearted over this. It's that passage where he says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. But then he says in chapters 15 and 16, I'm not leaving you as an orphan. I'm sending another, like myself, the Holy Spirit. He'll not just be with you, he will be in you to encourage you, to comfort you, to empower you to do whatever it is that the Father has called you to do. He will never leave your side. He will always be with you. And now before they cross the Kidron Valley and enter into the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prays what I believe truly should be called the Lord's Prayer. We always call that Matthew 6, the Sermon on the Mount, Lord's Prayer, uh, Our Father who art in heaven. That's really the model prayer. That's the prayer Jesus prayed for his disciples to show us how to pray. That's the disciples' prayer or the Lord's Prayer. Or, 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 excuse me, the model prayer. This prayer in John 17, which is the longest of any of Jesus' prayers in the gospel, truly is the Lord's prayer. In it, the heart of the Master, the heart of Jesus, is laid bare as his soul is exposed for all the world to hear this most intimate conversation that he has with the Heavenly Father and his most distinctive desires for his disciples. You know, when a man knows he's about to die, his prayers reveal his priorities. You really get down to praying for what you care about most, I think, when you know you have just hours to live. And here's what Jesus prays about in this prayer. He begins, first of all, by praying for God's glory, for the Father to be glorified in the Son. That was always near to Jesus' heart. God be glorified. He prays then for the disciples. He prays for their perseverance, that they will remain faithful and true in their walk with him. He prays for their protection, that they be kept from the evil one and from the world, which is opposed to God. He prays for their sanctification, that they be set apart in holiness and in righteousness for the mission that he has given. And then in verses 20 through 23, our portion of the text this morning, Jesus prays for the disciples' unity. But I want you to understand, he's not just praying for the unity of those 11 men. He's praying, as we'll see in a moment, for the unity of all disciples. He's praying for the unity of Pioneer Drive Baptist Church. Let's stand in, the, in honor of the reading of God's Word. And I'll begin in the New American Standard Version, reading John 17, verse 20. Jesus says, I do not ask, and he's praying to the Father, I do not ask in behalf of these alone, speaking of the eleven. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who will believe in me through their word. That is you. We have come to believe in Christ through the testimony of the word of God, the testimony of these apostles. Verse 21, that they may all be one. That's speaking of us. Even as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be in us, that the world may believe that thou didst send me. And the glory which thou hast given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be perfected in unity, that the world may know that thou didst send me, and didst love them even as thou didst love me, or as another has translated it, that they may know that you love them even as much as you love me. God's word has been read. And now may His Holy Spirit 
Bless the reading of his word. And may we apply the preaching and teaching of his word to our hearts and our lives this day. Please be seated. Do you remember when you were a really young person, and some of you are young enough to remember it today, what your dream car was, your dream vehicle? Most of us probably had one. I remember mine because it was Christmas of 1965. I was 11 years old. We had just moved to California, and I was given a, uh, we called them slot cars back then, a little electric car set. It had a little track and two slot cars. They're about a little bit bigger than a, than a Hot Wheel car, but they had a little motor in them, and, and they ran on the slots of the track. One was a red Corvette Stingray. The other, I almost have to put my hand over my heart, was a canary yellow 1965 Ford Mustang. That car captured my heart as an 11-year-old. I had a little girlfriend in Brownwood, and her big sister was driving, and she had that very car. I became engaged to Mustangs that Christmas. Three years later... I said I do to Mustangs when I went to see the movie Bullet starring Steve McQueen. Well, Steve McQueen was the lead actor. The star of the movie was really that 1968 dark green fastback 390 GT Mustang. It's called the Bullet Mustang. This summer when I attended the Southern Baptist Convention in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, I went to the exhibit hall and when I stepped off the elevator in the exhibit hall, this is what I saw the replica of the 1968 Steve McQueen. No, that's not Steve McQueen. I know you think that's him. <laughs> Steve McQueen, when I was growing up, was the coolest guy in all of Hollywood. Cooler than James Bond. Cooler than Iron Man Flett. He was it. And Steve McQueen made this movie, Bullet. It's a cop movie. And in that, he drove this car, uh, which, as I said, was the star of the movie, the, the fastback Mustang. And, and it, it was my dream car growing up. I've driven now and owned five Mustangs, a 267, a 60, a 267, um, an 05, a 14, and now a 17. Uh, I, I love Mustangs. Jeff Reed has driven two Mustangs. He didn't start driving them until I got here. Not because he had the same experience with Mustangs growing up as I did, because, but because he, well, he wants to be like me. Um, <laughs> he will never tell you that. When I saw that car coming off, I, I, I just like a, a hungry man walking into Perini's, I started to salivate. In fact, I'm glad that doesn't show my feet because there's a pool of drool down there on the floor that when I saw that car, I thought, oh, my goodness, that's it. Nowadays, my dream car is not that Mustang. As I've become older, my dream car is any car that's paid for and is low maintenance. That's my dream car. But we all have to have a car nowadays. Seems like. We don't live on the farm anymore where we grow our own food and cook and don't have to go to the store. No, we need a car that will get us from home to work and home to church and home to school and, and home to wherever our, grandparents, our grandchildren rather are playing their next t-ball game or their next dance recital. We need an automobile. We need a vehicle to get us around. It's, it's just a necessity. God also has chosen a vehicle. God needs a vehicle that will help him get his story and the reality of his love for humanity and the salvation that he has purchased through Christ for all of us. He wants to get that message out to the world. And he's chosen a vehicle to do that. That vehicle is you. It's me. It's the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And just like I have a favorite model vehicle and you have a favorite model vehicle, it might be a Mustang, it might be a truck. God has a favorite model church. He has an affinity for a church that's united. God works best through a church that is unified. Because such a model, such a church is going to most accurately communicate and demonstrate God's love to a watching and curious world. Now, you've got a lot of room on your worship guide today to take notes. So let me encourage you to write this down if you're taking notes. Unity is a vehicle for God's mission. Unity is a vehicle for God's mission. Look back at verse 20 of our text. And again, I encourage you to keep your Bibles open this morning. Verse 20 begins with the Greek verb eroto, which means I ask or I pray. It's the second time Jesus uses it in this text. The first time is in verse 9 where he prays for the disciples' protection and he prays for our joy. By using it a second time in verse 20, 
I think he's changing this, or shifting the emphasis of his prayer and the concern that he has for his disciples as they face their future mission. He says in verse 20, I do not ask in behalf of these alone, speaking of these 11, but for those who would believe in me through their word. Clearly, Jesus intends his disciples to not be hoarders of the gospel, hoarders of the good news, but to pass it on to the next generation, to become disciple makers themselves. He has made them disciples. Now it's their turn to go out and make disciples of others for Christ. The Apostle Paul, who wasn't one of the original apostles, but he was an apostle nonetheless, writes the same thing to his young son in the faith, Timothy, who was a pastor. In 2 Timothy 2.2, he says, Those things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men. These things entrust to faithful men who will in turn entrust them to others. That's the mission of the church. That's the mission... That's so dear to the heart of Christ that that the gospel that we have received, we be faithful to pass it on to the next generation who is to pass it on to the next generation. That's been happening now for 2000 years. Praise God. In every generation, there have been those who have been faithful to pass the gospel on until eventually it came to Abilene, Texas and to you and to me. And in this prayer, Jesus links the success of that mission to unity. Listen again to verses 20 and 21. Jesus prays, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be in us, that the world may believe that thou didst send me. Unity is indeed a vehicle for God's mission and it enables the world it enables the world to realize what God has been doing in Christ. God sent Jesus on the vital mission to demonstrate God's love for the world, for his people. And look at verse 23 of the prayer. Jesus prays, I in them, the church, thou in me, that they may be perfected in unity. And what's to be the result of that unity? He goes on, that the world may know that thou didst send me and didst love them even as thou didst love me. When the world sees the love that God has for the church, and when the church, when the people of the church are loving one another as God has loved them, that becomes a force, a magnet that draws people to faith in Christ. And they begin, the world begins to see what God was up to and what God's been doing in and through Jesus Christ. You know, at the time that Jesus prayed this prayer, his disciples were not really that unified. They're in that upper room. Jesus has washed their feet. He has served them the Lord's Supper. He has dismissed Judas as the betrayer. And in the midst of all of that, Luke twenty two twenty four tells us that a dispute arose among the disciples as to which one of them was the greatest. Jesus is facing the cross, crucifixion in a matter of hours, and the disciples are concerned about the glory they're going to receive. They're jockeying for prestige and position. That must have broken the heart of our Savior because a church divided, a band of disciples disunited is a denial of the very faith that we are called to believe and profess and proclaim. Time and again in this prayer, Jesus says to the Father, you are in me and I am in you and may they be in us. Our unity as a church is to mirror the unity that exists between the Father and the Son. A perfect unity, not an imperfect disunity or division. You know, in a big church, and Pioneer Drive is a big church. I know there are a lot of churches way bigger than us. But most churches in Texas, most Baptist churches run about 100 in worship in Sunday school on Sunday morning. So we are considered a big church. And in a church like this, it's where there are multiple ministries and multiple mission uh, divisions or ministry divisions. It's, it's, it's very easy for a church to slip into what's been called a silo, S-I-L-O, a silo mentality. You've driven across the United States, Midwestern states, and you've seen those great big grain and corn silos uh, out, in the, out in the fields. 
in each one of those silos. Uh, there are tons and tons of grain. And if you call that silo that's closest to us silo number one, the grain of silo number one isn't shared with the grain of silo number two. And the grain in silo number two doesn't intermingle with what's in silo number three. And silo number three could care less about the grain in silo number four. Each one is like a little kingdom, a silo kingdom unto itself. The same thing can happen in a church. A youth ministry can become a kingdom unto itself. A women's ministry, a children's ministry, a, a music ministry, a deacon fellowship can become a kingdom unto itself. Where all those involved in that little part of the ministry, that silo, could care less about the other parts of the church, and they don't want to share their resources and their volunteers and, and their budget money with anybody else. And when that happens, what occurs is the mission of God to redeem a lost world to himself becomes secondary to the missions of each little silo in the church. That silo mentality infiltrates a church. That silo philosophy infects a church with a virus that can become fatal such that the, 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 the dirtiest word in church language is heard often. And that's the word mine. Mine. Church family, as long as you have the staff that you have now, I'm not saying this just to keep us around, and as long as you have the deacon fellowship that you have now and the leadership of this church you have now, there will never be a silo mentality allowed to exist at Pioneer Drive Baptist Church. That will kill a church quicker than anything else. No sacred cows. No miniature kingdoms. Because every part of the church, every ministry of the church, every member of the church is a member of the whole body. Part of the whole family. And we are called to protect and to promote the life and the health and the vitality and the unity of the church. His church. Our church. Unity is vital. Because, as Jesus prays in verse 21, unity is an act of Christian witness. Look again at verse 21. He prays that they may all be one, even as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be in us. That the world may believe that thou didst send me. Praise the same thing in verse 23. That they may be perfected in unity, that the world may know that thou didst send me. A unified church where the members are walking hand in hand to accomplish the mission of God points a divided humanity to God and to his love. The choir sang about it a moment ago. In fact, if you back up just two pages in the Gospel of John, you'll be in the 13th chapter where Jesus, in that upper room, says a new commandment I give unto you. That you love one another, which is not a new commandment. That's in the Old Testament. But it's new in this, that you love one another as I have loved you. And that's a new kind of love. And he says, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Now, here's how this works. A non-Christian comes to our church, Pioneer Drive. Somebody doesn't know Christ as their Savior. Not a part of the church, but maybe interested. And so they're looking at the church. Not the church building or the church landscaping, but at you, the people who are the church. They're looking at this congregation. They've been in Abilene for a good while. They know you. And they say, now I know that fella. On the back bumper of his pickup, he's got a faded Trump for president bumper sticker. And I know that guy over there on the back of his truck, he's got a Hillary for president bumper sticker. And it's faded too. And I know that guy over there. I've known him for a long time and I know what he struggles with. I know what he's dealing with. And I know that lady, she doesn't watch anything but Fox News. And that guy over there, he posts everything that he hears on MSNBC. And I've known that family for a long time. I know where they come from. And yet here they are, sitting side by side, singing together and 
praising God together. And they study the Bible together in Sunday school and they pray for one another. And what is this? How does that happen? How can this be? And what they're seeing is something that can only take place by the power and the love of God. I've told you this before. You may have heard her share her testimony before. A family came to our church a little over 20 years ago. It was in the mid-90s. He was an airman at the base. And they had children, young children. She is European. In fact, she's still not an American citizen. You would never know it. Her English is almost perfect. And um, she had never been in a church before. When I say never been in a church, never attended a worship service, never had been to a funeral in a church or a wedding in a church, had never been in a church. But raising small children in Abilene, Texas, she thought, you know, they need some moral guidance, probably more than the school can provide and more than I can provide. Maybe the church would help. So she got what we used to call yellow pages, and she opened the phone book to the yellow pages and just went down churches and picked one. On that Sunday morning that she was taking her kids to church for the very first time, she drove by Pioneer Drive's billboard. We have one billboard in town. You have to see it real quick. It's when you're driving north on the Winters Freeway. To the left is the mall. To the right is our billboard. It's behind the wings, chicken wings or wild wings or something. It's behind that. It used to be behind uh, uh, Blockbuster. But if you move to Abilene since Blockbuster's gone, uh, it's, it's wild wings. It's right behind that billboard. You have to look fast to see it. Back then, we had a, a replica of our steeple. It was wooden on that billboard. Well, it was in desperate need of repair, the whole billboard. The, the steeple was crooked. It was turned, and, and part of it was, the cross was broken. And, and parts of the billboard were peeling off. The paper was peeling off. And as this lady saw that billboard, she said, Oh, kids, look at that pitiful billboard. That church probably needs our help. So instead of going to the church she was going to, she came to Pioneer Drive with her family that day. In time, she and her whole family trusted Christ, were baptized, and became an integral part of this church family until Uncle Sam took them elsewhere. Her testimony, and we're always worried, are we treating our guests like they ought to be treated? Do they all feel welcome? Her testimony was not about how she was treated. She said, I was treated fine. Her testimony was, when I looked around and saw how those people treated one another, how they loved one another, I said to myself, I don't know what that is, but whatever they've got, I want it for me and for my family. When the world sees the church in harmony with God and in harmony with one another, then that prayer of Jesus, I and thee and thou and me and all of them together as one in us, that prayer begins to be answered. And the mission of Jesus begins to be accomplished. And we talked about vehicles. For a vehicle to run, it has to have fuel. Fuel fires the engine. Fuel propels the vehicle forward. The fuel that propels the engine of you, or ignites rather, the engine of, of unity and helps cultivate unity in the church and we touched on this last week, is what we call nowadays spiritual formation. We used to call it just discipleship. Dallas Willard said there's nothing wrong with the church that discipleship cannot cure. And I believe he's right. Discipleship or Christian discipline. Unity is not a matter of just coming to church once a week and holding hands and singing we're all in the bond of love and then leaving and just forgetting about one another and forgetting about the mission of Christ. No. No. Spiritual formation practices such as the discipline of prayer and the discipline of worship and the discipline of reading God's Word and studying and meditating on God's Word and confessing our sin and sharing Christ and fellowship and service and ministry. All of that helps us grow closer to God. It it helps ground us in our faith. And as we grow closer to God, we're growing closer to one another. Once again, take that worship guide and do what I did in the last service. Real simple. Take, take it. You're just sitting there. Take it, okay? And grab that pen that's in the pew rack in front of you. And on your worship guide, draw an equilateral triangle. Equilateral triangle, okay? One with 
all three sides the same. Don't worry about the base of the triangle, but at the top, at the apex, just write the word God. G-O-D, God at the apex. And then on each side of the triangle, going up toward the apex, about a quarter of the way up, draw a little arrow that points upward on both of them. And then another arrow about halfway up and another arrow about three quarters of the way up. So that you've got your triangle with the two sides heading up to God with two uh, arrow here, arrow here, arrow here, arrow here, arrow here, arrow here. Six arrows, three on each side. Let that one side of the triangle be you and this side of the triangle be me or, or another member of our church. What it illustrates is as we grow closer to God through prayer, through worship, through Bible study, through ministry, through sharing our faith, as we grow closer to God, the distance between those arrows is less and less. In other words, as we grow closer to God, we're growing closer to each other in unity. And as we draw nearer to God, we begin to reflect more and more of God's character. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, the fruit of the Spirit becomes part of our lives. And the relationship we have with Him begins to play itself out in our relationships with one another. Francis Schaeffer, in his book, The Mark of a Christian, calls this the final apologetic. Now, that may be a new word to you. Apologetics. Christian apologetics. It doesn't mean we go around apologizing that we're Christians. Apologetics means offering proof or evidence for what we believe. Evidence for the Bible. Evidence for the resurrection. A good example in Scripture is evidence that Jesus is the Son of God is the resurrection. In, in, in uh, Romans 1.4, Paul says that Christ is the... Um, oh boy, having a senior moment here. In Romans chapter 4, at least I can remember, chapter 1, verse 4, I remember the, the reference. Um, yeah, Paul says that Christ was declared to be the Son of God with power through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. The resurrection is the ultimate uh, uh, Christian apologetic for, the, resu- for, for the, the, the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. God raised him from the dead. That proves that he is who he says he is. Well, apologetics offers proof. And Francis Schaeffer says the greatest proof that we can offer to the world that Jesus is who he said he is, is that verse, verse 21. When they see the world in unity, they see the church, rather, in unity. So, Schaefer writes in his book, we cannot expect the world to believe that the Father sent the Son, or that Jesus' claims are true, or that Christianity is true, unless the world sees some reality of the oneness of true Christians. He contends the world is going to judge whether Jesus has been sent by the Father on the basis of something that is open to observation. And he's right. Because Jesus prayed that they may all be one, that the world may believe that thou didst send me. Unity. It is both the fuel for the vehicle of God's mission, but it's also evidence of the achievement of God's mission. And if we need evidence of that, then just consider some of what one church in Abilene was able to do this last year, in 2017, by coming together united in that mission of Christ. That church put on an Easter pageant that reached thousands in our region with a visual presentation of the story of Jesus. That church, with the help of 150 volunteers, put on a seminar for women, a conference for ladies. 800 plus attended. Five ladies came to know Christ. And hundreds more were drawn closer to Christ and their relationship with Him. The Church Development Center here is growing. It's numbers we haven't seen in years. Reaching new families. Sharing Christ with them. Some of them now a part of our church. Last year, in our children's ministry alone, 24 children came to faith in Jesus Christ. In our recreation ministry, Not only did hundreds and hundreds of children hear the gospel every week through their practices where verses are memorized and verses are shared through the Upward Ministry Youth Program or or Recreation Program, but we had an Easter egg hunt. That doesn't sound like much, but it was for this area, this neighborhood. And we believe in time it will become as popular as the Fall Family Fun Night, which had 4,000 people from Abilene on our campus. We had 
neighborhood children two years ago that started coming to our church because we offered them the meal on Wednesday night and, and recreation and then Bible study. And these kids had never been to church before, just children in our neighborhood, in the shadow of a steeple of our church steeple, and they've never been to church. They didn't know how to act when they got here, and it caused some problems. Those children now are not known as the neighborhood kids. They're known as our kids. They're Pioneer Drive kids. Last year, we built two homes in Guatemala. That may not sound like a lot, but if it was your family, it would be a lot. We raised over $250,000 for the World Mission Offering. That doesn't include $300,000 plus that you give through the cooperative program, what you're doing across the street, what we're doing at, down in, in, in Alameda and at... Uh, a shining star. But just look in your worship guide. What was done? Uh, Nathan put this in the uh, in the worship guide this week. The International Mission Board, nearly one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. North Mission American Board, uh, nearly thirty thousand uh, dollars. That helps support over seven thousand missionaries and their families overseas and in North America. And on and on it goes. You built a church in Weed, New Mexico. You conducted over 200 worship services at a local at local nursing homes. You helped fund a new coffee farm in Laos in Southeast Asia. Helped fund the remodeling of a church in the Bronx in New York City. Hosted three families of missionaries that were furloughing in our missions house. The Alameda Toy Store blessed 30 families. We partnered with their neighborhood association to give out 100 backpacks of school supply. 42 Middle schoolers from Pioneer Drive went on mission trip. That's the most middle schoolers ever on their mission trip, working at the children's home up in Oklahoma City. Super week. At the end of the summer, we had over 200 students every night on our campus, high school students, some of them unchurched, some of them lost. And on the high school and middle school campuses, some of our students are the leaders in their FCA huddle groups. They're leaders in their Young Life ministries. We filled three new staff positions this past year. Christy Stanton serving as our children's minister. Craig Stotts as the worship pastor in the gathering. Terrence Waldron as our youth pastor. And they're doing incredible work. And on and on it goes. This is just a microcosm of what's happening across this church because the church is united. Pioneer Drive is a big church. Lots of moving parts, arms, legs, hands, and feet. All part of one church, one body, united in one Lord and one mission. And that one mission is summarized in one verse of Scripture, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 5, where Paul says, What we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants, for Jesus' sake. That's the mission. That's what we're about. What are you doing? To help maintain and promote the unity in your church. What are you going to do in response to this prayer of Jesus? This magnificent text. You know, usually when we pray, we ask Jesus, hear our prayer and answer our prayer. But when it comes to unity and God's mission, we have the opportunity to be part of the answer to Jesus' prayer. May Pioneer Drive Baptist Church truly be a vehicle that God can use to accomplish His mission. One church, one Lord. One church, one mission. Unity. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we desire to be one of the churches, one of the many churches in Abilene, Texas, Taylor County, this association that you're using to accomplish your mission. We thank you that we get to do this in concert with other churches, and not just Baptist churches, but all who name you as Savior and Lord. Help us to join hands with one another in love for each other. And in fervor to fulfill the mission that you have given. Truly, Lord, may others see Jesus in us as we love each other as you've taught us to.
This is our prayer. This is our word of praise to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me? We're going to sing a hymn of commitment this morning. Be strong in the Lord. Be of good courage. It takes that sometimes to be a part of his mission, but he's given us his spirit to empower us, to enable us to do whatever he calls us to do. Maybe you're here this morning. You've been looking for a church home. There are so many good churches in Abilene. But maybe he's led you to Pioneer Drive. And, and maybe you hear him speaking to your heart today saying, this is where you need to plant your life to serve and grow with this body of believers. We'd love to have you as part of our church family. We'll ask you to find a place of service in time. Not right away, but in time. We had somebody recently, in the last year or so, who was starting a Sunday school class. We said, you know, you really need to be a member before you start teaching Sunday school. Oh, okay. So they joined. Happened to be the president of the University of Hardin Simmons, but... Uh, or maybe somebody shared Christ with you this week. And for the very first time, you came to realize that what he did on the cross and at the empty tomb, he did for you. And maybe you opened your heart and said yes to Jesus. And you've just been waiting for this moment so you could come forward and say, Pastor, I'm a believer. I've trusted Christ and I just want the church to know and I want the world to know. And I want to follow him in baptism. The altar is always open. If you need to come and pray. For the next 50 weeks of 2018, the next 50 Sundays, this altar is open. You can come and pray. However God might be leading, if you need a decision to make public, this is the time to respond. I'll be here to receive you. Brother Eddie is here. More importantly, the Lord waits. You come as we sing together. Be strong in the Lord.